so this is like in a me I trust like I it's almost like this phrasing it's like biblical to me too um like when you say in a god we trust but we like in a me I trust like it's kind of like connected to now I I didn't think about it when I was making the art but now when I'm talking to you yeah. it kind of feels like that we are our own little gods that we have to that we have the power of our life of our decisions that we we can shape it like you can sit in this room for all your life if you don't gonna get up and make a decision to get up i'm so glad that we are we are doing this we are recording a first podcast yet we know each other for a really really long time and it's true and oh my god like i'm just i just super ridiculously happy that you are here and you are part of this big big project i think it's my biggest so far exhibition which i co-curate skin in the game and and you are a huge part of this show Hong Kong will you see first time your beautiful work. Yeah, I know. It's it feels to me like I'm there, but I'm here, but I'm like in 20 other places in the same time. But like, yes, first of all, congratulations that it's like your biggest show mm -hmm. achievement so far. I know there is many more to come. And uh coming back to Hong Kong and Eva Budka artwork there, it is. It's my first time. I've been in the airport like many times, but like never past the airport well so you're supposed to be here i remember two years ago right that was two years ago two years ago right yeah it's already happening like we have this covid pandemic situation for two years everybody i know yeah, yeah. it's been two years so, so you're supposed to come to visit to visit me and many galleries and have your first appearance in hong kong it was, in 2020 yeah it was like March. may or march yeah that was march 2020 yeah and could you tell us what happened why you haven't been able to come like could you could you tell us a bit of the yes. story, the background story because i think it's quite interesting of, <laughs> of course i mean as everybody i feel like all pandemic stories are kind of like a great uh, Netflix almost like an episode like we could do a show in Netflix about each of us having like a different crazy story about pandemic some of them will be really sad and dark uh, which of course it's horrible but um, my story begins when my 2020 was starting and I had like this calendar full of travels like I was like Hong Kong with, with you like exhibition in Reykjavik travel to Japan travel back like I was in New York and uh, I would be that year I was supposed to be like a little bit in between Europe and New York and have a show in New York with friends. Oh God, it was a lot. And that was a year like totally fulfilled with art exhibitions and um, really interesting art residencies that I was very happy about. One was in Florence for over a month. It was, yeah, I literally had packed bags for each of the trip on the beginning of the year. And uh, what happened is I'm like, well, February feels a little like free for me and uh, I can like work on my artworks uh, for my exhibition in Reykjavik. And I was like, mom, dad, who lives in Poland and they're artists also, printmakers, I'm like, mom, dad, I think I'm going to come to print my exhibitions in Poland at the time. And also I can see my boyfriend who is in Poland and who lives in Poland 10 minutes away from my parents. So I'm like, let's just connect all of it. There's a Valentine's day, there's like art making, like why would I be in New York alone? So I literally packed like a little, little bag for just like two weeks and I'm traveling, Eva is traveling to Poland to do art. And as soon as I landed, like the COVID news were like happening, like it's really bad in China. And I'm like, yeah, but like, it's not gonna get to Hong Kong, right? Or like, it's not gonna get there. And we kind of, we were like texting, like, oh, I think this is still happening. I think this is gonna be really going. But then some of my, um, I had like this art festival in South of France in May and the festival, already was like connecting with me and being like listen you can like COVID is really I think gonna hit Europe so we have to cancel and postpone and I'm like what like so if they're postponing like stuff in May like what's about in March and I was just like here in Poland and basically 
on the day that I had like my flight back to New York, I couldn't take it because the COVID happened and they made a lockdown. It was like the beginning of March and I got stuck here and in a good way and bad way because I was with my family and with my boyfriend full of love. And then I'm like, but well, it's going to probably finish in a week. And then I can go back to New York. I can travel to Hong Kong. Well, Hong Kong got closed. The whole world frozen. Like, we all know that. And then this beautiful miracle had happened that I became pregnant. And I'm like, great. Yay. <laughs> <but> yay. <laughs> but I cannot, like, at that time, I'm like, okay, I guess I can fly and, like, do all the art world thing with a belly right like people do that but not in COVID times so I was pregnant and I had to stay in Poland and my pregnancy was at risk so I had to be very careful about um not moving and definitely not flying um eight hours in overseas and all of that was just like a mix of emotion yeah and anyway, so even if you would right like it's it's not that you could fly to hong kong which was yeah that was another thing i'm like US there was like no planes down. yeah and there was like no planes i'm like well i cannot take a boat and like go to you or like it, it was like it was a very i mean for everybody we did really i was very scared at the time when it was just like the beginning of happening of like the lockdown in poland and like we of course worried about my parents about other parents like it was I felt like I'm like a radio station connecting like uh, all the continents and countries and like texting, like, how are you there in here? How are you here in Hong Kong? How are you in Philippines? I, it was just like all over, like to see what's going on in the world. And then here I am like connecting with the world. There's no planes, which in my mind, it was not possible. It was like a nightmare because my life was so connected to flying all the time and traveling all the time. And then I couldn't do it. And then here we go. There's like a, like a life beginning in me. So there's like a new chapter opening. And I really, I was very happy and I wanted very badly to have a baby, but it's, it was a lot. I was like another universe in a universe with a new universe, <laughs> like getting bigger and bigger. And the mix of like the milkshake of emotions and, and, and worries and happiness and excitement. It was, it was like another level of like a change, like a big change in all possible directions. And also I had to think about my my apartment with a huge studio in new york and like what to do with it like can i go back like calling landlord and the landlord was worrying too like oh my god what do we do like people are leaving new york and there were riots in new york which like yeah. all of it it was like a i kind of feel right now speaking about it and i i can see what we i have behind me like this huge painting that i was doing and i i started it actually a little bit after when uh when my son was born but it connects like I feel a lot of emotions it's very like I have like this dark black brushes and small dots of dark emotions and then there is some sort of fight between the evil and and happiness uh, in the back and that was I feel like my state of mind uh during the pandemic um so dot yeah. Yeah, that was yeah, just yeah. one question and here I answered <laughs> here yeah no it, I, I find it amazing like just how how unexpected all the two years the last two years um have have, have been and uh, it, it still is it's not normal right how it is and yeah it's I, not I'm actually curious um, how your art has changed so you know I mean you already mentioned a bit that you are from a family of artists so you obviously you were with art for like from from the, the time when you could since I'm in a belly so, yeah yeah <laughs> oh exactly mom. so so basically you are doing this all your life I remember um, your beautiful exhibition on the end of your study um yes. when everyone like just was so amazed about what you produce and oh, yes I mean I think everyone's life is very unexpected of course pandemic had just proved that but uh my life since the beginning it was very much driven by 
risk taking uh, and and like just going with a goal and a dream that I have. And that dream was like a spaghetti noodle to another dot. So from one dot of spaghetti to another dot to another, it, it was just like, so I moved and I feel like it's like a funny, like a spider web or something for uh, a lot of coincidences and decisions that I've taken to that I landed in New York or that I landed in Poland or that I landed, like the whole story is very beautiful in a way, but um, it's true. I, um, when I was studying in uh, Poland uh, at the Academy of Fine Arts in Warsaw at the, like a printmaking department, um, I took two different class, like a major classes in book design and in printmaking. And I really like, I thought for almost all my life that I'm going to be either a writer, guess what, <laughs> like yeah, a writer, or that I'm going to be um, a book illustrator for kids. And that was like all that I could think of. And my parents are both printmakers. And my sister actually wanted to be an architect, but then she's a printmaker. And I'm like, I'm not going to be like all of them. Like, I'm just, I have my own way. I love illustrations. And it was very much not abstract what I have been doing. And I took classes at the Academy of Fine Arts um, of painting that I thought that, again, I will never be a painter. That's what I was saying. Like, I cannot paint. I don't know how to paint. And I took classes with this huge master of Polish painting world called Leon Tarasevich and Tarasevich uh, made the biggest influence I think on everything what was happening after in my art career and and my how my art looks like he basically on a first like kind of class like uh, told me Eva I don't want you to use brushes I don't want you to use sticks anything you just use your hands and I'm like excuse me, are you talking like I should paint with my hands, like if in a kindergarten? And he's like, <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what I mean. You have too much, like, like you're like too much thinking about what you want to paint instead of just go for it. And I'm like, well, but I really want to plan it. And so he's like, no, like you just use your hands, face, I don't care, like legs, but no brushes. Girl, I struggled. Like, I was like, no, I really like this thin line and I'm going to be this illustrator but he pushed me definitely out of my comfort zone. And I suddenly realized that I feel so happy with painting, with like creating this abstract world of marks and lines. And, and, and I remember like one of the first assignment was to create like paint a dog, which sounds like so illustrative, but it just started to be so beautifully abstract. And that class really opened me up. And that is really one of the, like turning points in my uh, in my art because um, I started to create abstract and that time I was also helping my father to um, kind of just only at that time translate his uh, research for finding a different plates to do a lithography because he had my, my father he's a professor of lithography at the fine art school in Katowice which is in Silesia district in Poland and he is this incredibly smart master of lithography. And lithography is one of the printmaking processes that uses a lithostone, a limestone, to produce uh, prints. And this limestone has this magical, those are my words, not my father's words. Uh -huh. like this mag it, it has like this magical um, thing in it that it remembers all the grease marks. So if you would touch it with your hands or if you would even lay your face on this stone, it will remember everything. And you can print that pattern on multiple uh, papers. And that's how people started uh, to create maps and pay, like money and, and first posters by Toulouse-Lautrec in France. So it was like this very big thing um, over like that time of, of, of our art history. Um, but my father, he's, uh, teaching it right now. And it, it, there is like this huge renaissance of lithography happening through the whole world because Carl Lagerfeld, who used to, when he was still with us, he was creating lithographies. David Lynch is also doing lithographies. And my dad was just really sad that the stones, the magical stones are only in this one place in the world, in Bavaria, in Germany, 
and you can and you can only dig them out from this specific parts and from the earth but earth is not anymore giving those stones so you have a certain amount of the stones in the world and and this technique would die in a couple of years so um why is that like do you know the um, why it's only in germany and why it's not um well suddenly i mean this is like the story of this tech like of the technique that this particular limestone you only can dig out from the earth from that part of the world this has to do something with the beginning of our existence and how the world was creating and shaping like this particular um, version of the limestone is only able to get from there. It's not going to happen in a matter of a year or two. There is like a couple, definitely like 10 to 20 years ahead of us um, before we cannot get any more of those stones. But the dream of an artist and of a true, I think, master and a professor who's a teacher, he wants to like be sure that for generations, like you can sustain this technique and you can really get um, a good plate that it's gonna have a very similar result um, to what the limestone has to offer. Uh, because each time you're doing a paint, like a drawing on the limestone and then you're doing printing, you have to polish down and sand down the drawing to create a new one. So basically there is this beautiful process of kind of um, like creating your art, but you're also like destroying your art, you're erasing it from the plate, and then you're creating a new layer for the same um, print. So uh, that kind of mindset my father um, has, and me as his daughter, I was definitely in love with those stones because they are laying down around our house, and, and, and I know the smell of them, and I love the touch of them, and he basically um really wanted to find some other surface some other place that he can use to create those uh those marks the same way and americans they do that they did discover and they do that in the tamarin university um in states uh this kind of mech calf for uh, lithographers they created like this metal plate that they are preparing specifically to create the plate, the surface so sensitive as the stone. But for some lithographers, there's like this huge debate between two blocks of thinking. Like a limestone is like this organic, beautiful um, surface and a feeling. So when you look at the lithography printed from limestone, you can really see like some organic magical feeling. And then for some like lithographers, using a metal plate it's not enough like it just feels like it's been created by a machine or it's like not as organic as it could so here we go with um where the mokurito where the japanese technique of lithography from wood comes into the middle where suddenly we discovered that oh 20 years ago this artist seishi ozaku discovered and created this very beautiful technique of lithography that he's printing from wood, but by saying it, it's not a woodcut. It can be because Makurito and, and roots is kind of like you can have two techniques in one plate because you have a wood where you can draw and paint and the wood remembers grease marks the same way magically as the magical stones. And you can also grave, like crave into them and um like create a wood marks on top of the flat marks so that was like this other big shift in what has had been happening with me and why i went to milwaukee um coming back to your question <laughs> um yeah that was is, a, this is a big circle but <laughs> i know but it's I'm kind like, of continue like, continue <laughs> <laughs> you can definitely chop it um but uh, coming back to uh the mokurito and the reason why i went to milwaukee um is I started to help my father research what kind of woods and what kind of ways we can really print this Japanese way. Um, and um, I remember I came back one time, uh, it was a Christmas time in Poland and I was living in Warsaw studying and I see my father in Silesia like full of like the, the whole studio, it's wood. And my dad is just like this little guy in, in the 
in a forest of wood. And I'm like, dad, what's up? And he's like, oh, I'm like, I'm trying to understand how to do this technique. It doesn't work. It doesn't make any sense. Like I'm trying to connect with Japanese uh, artists, but they are not really like, it's not easy to get to them. And then that was like, ding, in my head, I'm going to help him. <laughs> that was like my <laughs> mission. I'm a risk taker. I'm going to make it happen. So I connected with my dean at Warsaw Academy of Fine Arts, who had a connection to the um, Tama University in Japan, where Seishi Ozaku is a professor who is the creator of this technique. And I asked them with a letter through my dean, to connect with my father and with me that we really want to learn about how this beautiful technique is being made because we have seen some of the examples of lithographies on the exhibitions and they're amazing. And uh, they got back to us, they send us um, this the little one flyer explaining how to do Mokolito. So I was just like so excited when I just read in the envelope like, oh my God, we're gonna have a solution how to do it. So I opened this beautiful flair I do have it somewhere but I didn't prepare it for our talk it's literally it says you take wood you draw and you print and I'm like well <laughs> okay kind of this is like all the other really very important specifics because yeah you can definitely have a print even when you like spill a coffee on your kitchen counter and you put a paper that's also a print but it's a monotype there is no way you can repeat that and in the printmaking world it's very important to create or to have a practice a printmaking technique that it's repetitive that you can have one pattern up to 10 like an addition at least of 10 the same Mm -hmm. drawings mm -hmm. so I was like okay I'm gonna translate it to my dad but he's not gonna be satisfied so I did and my dad is like no you're definitely you can you don't understand English there has to be something more in those three sentences I'm like dad it's really not but based on this we applied for the European Union grant and we started a research how to really make that technique in a Polish condition. And that's the time when I decided to do my own research in Warsaw and my dad was in Katowice. And we were kind of calling each other all the time and connecting and figuring out like how to do what we're doing. And my dad, it comes from this world of logical and like very, like everything has like, reasons and and it's very strategic and I am from the world of let's just go for it let's just try different things and then I was listening to my dad but I'm like ah I'm not gonna do it that way I'm just gonna do this and this and that of course I was taking notes so I was playing a little bit of being the doctor in here but my versions started to work and I'm like dad I just printed like eight prints and they're the same so there is an almost we have this edition that we were struggling with because it wasn't difficult to have just one monotype printed but to find a wood that actually will give us this multiply effect and at the moment where I was literally coming up with how to print Mokulito is when I met two visitors two professors visiting uh, my school from Milwaukee Institute of Art and Design. And it was like the beginning of a year, which was like a second of January. And I'm not joking. I was like an obsessed person to be at school, even at, like after New Year's. And I was the only one in a workshop, like making these crazy notes about the wood. And, and I hear, I, I see like those two people and they're like coming to me what are you doing? And I'm like, hi, I am researching this Japanese technique. And I started telling everything what I just told you. And they were like, oh my God, this is amazing. Like, do you want to study in States? And I'm like, of course I want to study in States. Great joke. Go good, good. Of course. But uh, um, it's not possible. No, no, no. But like, do you really want to do it? Because we would love to offer you a scholarship. And I'm like, something I mean is fishy here like what do you mean like I don't know you and they gave me their email they told me the name of a school I researched it and I gave them my email and the same day in the evening I see this official letter in my mailbox from the school offering me a scholarship to continue my research on Makurito and I'm like oh my god dad mom like this is happening oh, I should yeah. probably take it and I did take that and that was the best decision in my life and I went to this six-month scholarship at Milwaukee Institute of Art and Design and that 
really where the butkalito process so the 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 version of mokulita like my own version how to print from wood started and how it happened because i could research every kind of wood that they had in us and i found out like what wood is the best to print what tools and i could use all different kinds of papers and they gave me every everything and more of what I needed. So the exhibition that you mentioned in Warsaw um, uh, for the end of my master's, it was all bunch of work that I've created during this scholarship. And it was all abstract work. It was all on the Japanese paper. And I started to um, learn how to really talk about my art, how to write about my art in US and how to even like sell myself. And that was like, a lot of advantages on top of the scholarship to not only be focused on the wood but that's also when I started to teach it and that's when I started to travel around states and have different offers to do workshops and presentations and um, that's how basically New York called me like I just went with one lecture then with another presentation then with an exhibition another exhibition and here I was living in New York and traveling around the world, giving lectures of how to do with Calito. So that was the answer of your question. Yes, and, and I, I wanted to, I, I didn't want to stop you because it just, yeah, there's so many amazing, so many amazing details. And I think like this, the, the story behind, like how have you started the project, where, where you came from, to it's extremely important to understand your art. So I just I yeah. I, I, I absolutely grateful that you did this did this beautiful yes. overview. And I know it's like a very detailed, but it's, but no, it's hard to it's say. It's simple. Yeah, exactly. No, no, it's still it's still. I, I'm sure, like if we have twenty four hours, you would give us more and more details, which which would be even better because then you are like have this full full picture. But yeah. you know let's let's focus about. So we already covered. You created first Butkalito, which I think sounds even better than Mukalito, by the way. Like in point Aww. of like, just just yeah. And I'm absolutely sure Thank that you. we're going to like one day some some young girl will call you and ask you. So how do you do Butkalito? Because I really want to use it in my work, right? Um, yeah, they do and, that. They, they, they do, do that it. already, right? So, yeah, yes, already it's happening. Here. Let me let me ask one question. So so I read a few articles where you were saying that Butkalito, so the, the stone which you are using, the wood which you are using uh, to print, it's like a body and the paper which you are using to print on it's like a skin so i would like to focus now about about the body what causes the body on so you already mentioned that that it's 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 based on the, this japanese technique but it's slightly different because that's your yes. version. so could you tell us a bit more about the body yes um so I always had a very interesting relation to a body and to my body. I was very, like one of those kids who are super interested how things are, how things work. So, um, and by looking at my body and seeing all the veins and, and how, like what is inside, how we're this magical universe in the shape that skin gives us. Um, so so I was always very interested about it. And while working on uh, my prints in Milwaukee, uh, coming back there <laughs> for a second, um, I saw that wood really reminds me of our human body, like all the wood grains and all the stories between the wood grains. I just couldn't separate from thinking, oh my God, it really looks like my body. It's so much there is in, there's so much history, there's so much emotion, there's so much words I see in the wood that it just naturally occurred to me that this is like my body. And um, I started to call it a body and the prints that I'm taking the imprint from the body, they felt like a skin to me because I was like ripped, like the whole printmaking process is also like this beautiful dance in between ink and paper and water. And there's a lot of technology behind it but 
but the meaning of taking an imprint from a press from the wet wood covered in ink and the moment where you're taking and separating this very thin Japanese paper from like this thick wood matrix that the, the, the Japanese paper picks up every little, every little thing that there is, I just couldn't help to not imagine that this is like taking off my skins in a good way, not that we are having some tortures here. <laughs> it was more like I'm taking off like my thoughts process, my emotions, my memories um, that I think, and I still think that I became, I started this process, like I started to think about a body and skin in 12, 2012, and we have a couple years after, but it's still somehow I'm coming back to this comparison that my body is the wood and, or even not my body, but a body representing humans and, um, and the skin represents to me like everything that we want to hide within our body, but it's actually visible. So all the things that we've been through, all the traumas or happy things or words that we hear, I really strongly believe that they, they, they come inside us. And even if we want to really truly hide it, like, no, everything is fine. It's going to come out. So so that is a little bit like this, I'm trying to capture in my art what is hidden inside of our bodies or what is hidden inside of my body. And um, I guess I have to mention also the part that my relation to body became even more intimate when, and, and important when I became a model at when I was 17 and model, the whole point of, I mean, the being a model is working with your body. So that is like this kind of, I felt like I'm in a, some sort of art performance, uh, going to different shows, different shoots and people put on my body, the clothes, the makeup, and I'm kind of like in the shell and I feel a lot, but it's not really allowed to show when you're a model. So there is constant gain on like putting more layers on, and other skin layers to protect of what you really feel. And the beginning of um, the process, like the, the, the series of work, the skin I have been living in, it's, um, it, it comes to the point where I was still modeling, but I was already uh, studying art and doing my masters. And I already started teaching and I already started to have a different view on my own body. And, I think also it has to come with a certain age, you start to think about different things. And now as a mom, I kind of come back. So I, I made this circle to thinking about the body because I realized through the pregnancy and motherhood that I really like was disconnected to hearing the sounds and the voices and what my body is really telling me. Um, cause we, we rush, we do, I, I rushed, I did so many things and I was, as I mentioned, traveling and working and I was like, like very speedy person, but I really forgot about what my body's communicating when I'm tired, when I'm hungry. I know those are really simple things, but we really, I didn't think about it. And pregnancy kind of made me listen to my body because I had to really be careful and I had to really be cautious of what are the signals that it's had like gives me so this really shaped um my art and it really shaped who I feel right now and like how I cherish the moment that I actually can have with my body which I didn't really like before mm -hmm. um because I was just focused on um running to another thing and like oh, I'm just gonna like I am tired but I don't care and then here I am like this really like this whole journey of becoming a mom made you like kind of forced you to to listen um what is important and and how you have to be empathetic almost with with your own body and how your body limits you and also it's limitless it's like all contradictions but you really live through them at least I did uh, and also be like now being a mom it's also like I 
I love the moment where I can just like for a second stand by myself and just kind of center myself and I want to listen to my breath I know it sounds like cliche but it really like breathing and and coming back to your center and hearing what your body is telling you it's all what it is right now for me what is really balancing everything was imbalanced in 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 a in a world and in my world so you, you touched so many interesting topics um but starting from the end and focus about mm-hmm. the exhibition and and all this beautiful work which you which i received and i am just i was so happy to to see frame and ready and um, i wanted to to ask you about about the, the the roles so every as you mentioned like you have so many roles in your life and they are all kind of equal depends on the day you are more mom that like on monday you can be a more mom on tuesday you can be more an artist boss. And a boss <laughs> or a, a director and then it's it's all very important and you don't want to necessarily say no to one or say oh i'm i i cannot be good mom and also have a career you want this to be equal from what i understood yes and then so you send me those words and then they are all kind of abstract but then i feel like the titles of the words they are giving a hint to the viewer what you wanted to say so let's say yeah. if we'll talk about them after a decade in, and then quotes, eh, me, I trust. Could you tell us a bit more? What did, what do you, what did you have in mind when you were making the, this work and a bit more about the process? I know that it's mixed media. So you used different materials and it's also on canvas. So it's something quite unusual for you to work on canvas you mostly focus on paper paper so mm-hmm. could, you, could you tell us a bit more about that yes um i'm really happy that you're like yeah i love how you're creating the questions because they give me already 20 ideas how to answer them and it's, <laughs> it's good great great so um i um mostly i was creating on paper because canvas was scaring to me like i felt very intimidated by this cotton canvas and it was so rich and so thick and it has a different story and I was so into paper and wood um, that I just couldn't find a reason why I would change the just like a simple thing as your surface but um, being in New York I started to paint on many different things such as cardboards I started to paint on wood instead of only using it as a matrix for my butcaritos and with that I obviously New York has so much art around and I saw a lot of um, Rotko and um, Rauschenberg and I don't want to again sound cliche but Basquiat is my one of my favorite and I'm like God, I love the way they're differently using canvas than than I thought you can. Like, it doesn't, it's like kind of what Tarasevich was like, just girl, take, throw away your brushes and just go for it. And I'm like, I I think I think wrong about a canvas. I think I should just treat it as a paper. And that's where, and I don't need it on the wood frame. I don't need it. Like, I can just buy a canvas and think about it as a paper. Just make a little something there and and then that's already gonna be like my paper sketch mark because when I see and that's when when I started to see this empty white space very beautiful like paper um that everything is possible to create there like a little different than on a paper for me um that basically it's full of possibilities more than on a paper because paper reacts differently um, when you are painting a lot and putting a lot of um, paints there here I am and I can really go all ever on it and I get I I kind of got addicted (laughs) to painting on canvas and the possibility that it gives it's um so that's that's like the, the story about why I became painting on a canvas but um and um the the question about like in a me that i trust it's 
oldest journey that I like through my therapy and through listening to smart podcasts and and reading a lot of books and like understanding how much wisdom we have within us and how much the intuition intuition is one of the biggest wisdoms and we tend to not listen to it and I really connected it to my body like the body voice is intuition the body voice is not only oh it hurts when I have two heavy bags of groceries it's 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 like the the body really speaks to you through the intuition and I realized that every time that I had listened to myself only and my intuition and to my own idea of risk taking such as discovering the butkalito and being like not listening to what people wanted to say I was just like no I want to try this and that's where I mostly succeeded in my life and that's when I started to create the work for Hong Kong exhibition about different women in me and different needs in me I this this print came out to me that all of the women they have this one inside of me they have this one thing in common they all want what's the best for me and they only know like I only know what's the best for me and if I'm not gonna know and be happy what's the best for me I'm not gonna give that happiness to my baby and mm-hmm. I'm not gonna be able to to just be happy and it, it all comes with like all the changes that I had to accept through the pandemic too like um I was literally in a way stuck in Poland a place that I haven't been for the past 10 or 15 years um this new reality that I was living in uh becoming a mom like so many changes and and struggles and I missed um so much from what I had before and that literally I could kind of see that I can dig everything that I need from myself and that all New York that all friends that everything is inside of me so and the voice that was telling me like what should I do next and how it's the same voice that tells me you need a tea time right now Eva you need to calm down or like you know what you want to run or you know you want to eat a pizza <laughs> like <laughs> this is this is like I, I really want to allow myself without a shame to say what I want and what I need um that also we live in a society that I believe that we still it still is happening that a girl a woman shouldn't be angry or like it's oh he's such a pretty girl you shouldn't be angry it's like a very polished thing to oh, say or yeah. I know or like the boys don't cry yeah all of those horrible cliches so you know what like fuck off <laughs> like <laughs> a girl can be pissed and a boy can cry and that's a mom that I want to be and that's that's a woman that I want to be who had created a man and I want that man to also listen to their its own voice and I don't want those rules and tags on him I kind of I mean I know he has to go through his life by himself but it was this is like I want to clean up as much possible of the bullshit away from from what he has to go through and what I had to go through so this is like in a me I trust like I it's almost like this phrasing it's like biblical to me too um like when you say in a god we trust but we like in a me I trust like it's kind of like connected to now I I didn't think about it when I was making the art but now when I'm talking to you yeah. it kind of feels like that we are our own little gods that we have to that we have the power of our life of our decisions that we we can shape it like you can sit in this room for all your life if you don't gonna get up and make a decision to get up yeah yeah yeah, yeah. absolutely absolutely and you know when i saw this canvas um i was really amazed about like how how much of these feelings i feel by personally as a viewer and they are talking to me so much and it just so perfect much, like material you know and it's like 
everything it's 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 quite big work it's like almost 160 centimeters and each of the centimeters it has something else to say this is what i i feel when i look at it and it's very also very female it's very energetic it's very sexual as well right because you are mm -hmm. You, you, you are this beautiful girl and you can see that on the, the canvas. So could you tell us a bit more about how, how, you, how you are making it? It's like, is that a long process itself? Yes. And also, um, I saw some markers, I saw some um, crayons. Like, mm -hmm. can, you, can you tell us a bit more about what, what, it's, what it's the body made of? I mean, the skin made of, sorry. Mm -hmm, of course. Um, so when I start painting or creating any sort of uh, piece of art, you, it's, it's again this blank canvas full of possibilities. It's kind of like creating a new world. And I, I love this moment because the first touch on a canvas is just like your first kiss or a first dream or a first uh, emotion, a strong emotion, a heartbreak a love for taste or a smell that you like and you've never felt before. And I really think about all of those emotions when I, when I create, but it's not that I'm forcing myself to be like, okay, now I'm gonna think about the first smell. No, it's more about like the J was the sound for making a line on the painting. <laughs> it's more, I feel like a sponge sometimes that drinks all the emotions, not only from myself, but from the world around. Um, or as Bill Cunningham said, that I eat with my eyes. Um, this amazing fashion photographer, uh, journalist, photographer. And I can totally relate to that. I eat with my eyes. Like I see things and I feel and, and I eat and I, just, I, I get the taste and the, the like emotion and all of that sponge that I like, I ate everything. I'm pouring out in my in my art like it's sometimes like too much to hold within my body so it has to go for my skin um and that's where like I'm thinking about creating this world and the that the white space blank with possibilities is becoming to be shaped with an emotion and I work with layers, like I never create, or I never have an idea, specific idea, how my piece would work and look from the beginning till the end. Not like, I do have an idea of colors, of some sort of shapes, but I let it live with its own life and starting to have a relationship with one another. Cause when you do one black line and then you do another black line, they start to have a relationship with each other and they resonate with a color they give each other their blackness but there's also the white space between and then it's literally like an animation almost process to me when I'm getting into it and I'm like in between those lines I'm behind the line and I'm feeling and I'm creating new relationships to those two lines and and then I love and it's very important to me too to um like stop in the middle of my process to just step away and look what I do and I create for a long time I I mean the process of making one line is definitely <laughs> like a, a simple and I mean not maybe simple but a very quick yeah. but I like for example the piece that I have behind me that I mentioned earlier um it could be any other piece but speaking of any pieces behind me is that they are here with me for over a month or two or three and I'm coming back to it when I'm ready and I look at them and the the thing that I always do is I look at the piece and then until something starts to move there or to talks to me or like this one line is like hey girl I need another line or I need a black color I need a pink color or I something says to me what it has to happen there and I'm like yeah you're not going to be that lonely anymore here. I'm going to do this and this. And this is literally the most honest and transparent explanation how I do my art process. There's a lot of music involved or there is a lot of um, words that they are involved. Uh, for the day-to-day 
uh, moments, I, I walk around the world and I pick those specific emotion and moments that they're holding that sponge. And then once I'm in my art studio, they're going away. It can be anything like an interesting smile of an older lady in a subway looking at her dog, or it can be as just how the sun hits sky care for like sky care sky care first what am i talking like the sky keepers sky the holy holy moly like the tall buildings in new york city oh a skyscraper it's sky- thank you so much yeah. <laughs> don't worry language. The powers. The powers. yes but i mean yeah how the sun is being hit by them like on the tall buildings and yeah. the reflections like all of these little moments even strawberries in a market how red they are and i'm like that red is gonna be on my painting it's uh it 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 works that way with me Mm -hmm. so this a particular and and definitely layers and this part like a piece that you were talking about that you have in hong kong is i think the essence of layers and layering and different colors that i picked through years i actually bought this uh, canvas a couple years ago as an actual like a canvas like the, the the pieces on the canvas and I couldn't like I was waiting for the moment when I want to open it and create on it it was like intimidating and over the summer I was in my parents cottage house in Poland and I lay it out on the grass and it's just like the world and the grass and the shadows and the sun and the Polish strawberries and Polish blueberries, everything just like came to me and went on the canvas in a way, like in, imagination wise, of course. And um, and it, it just, it started, I, I had to pick up all the colors that I did. I had to wait. I was actually creating it for over two or three months every day. Sometimes like I was sitting for a couple, I mean, sitting and being a mom is not really happening, but like even with a baby playing, the art, the piece was all the time on a, uh, on the building and, and I was constantly looking at it and creating all the uh, butkalitas there too simultaneously, because that's also what I do. I cannot just create one piece at a time. I have multiple pieces that I jump in between. Um, I will definitely share a video with you where you could see that how it's working and how like how I was creating this piece and all the other ones that you have on the exhibition simultaneously. Yeah, I also remember that in some part, because as you said, like the process itself was so long from the first brush touch, stroke, okay. touch uh, to, to the last layer. It, it was a long process. You were also traveling. I remember it quite vividly because you went to my favorite place in this planet, which is Portugal. And, yes. and I was curious if actually the traveling and also the colors which you see um, inspired you. And this is what you said actually about the strawberries and like, is there a bit of Portugal in it as well? You think? Uh, maybe in a smaller one, not in a big one, not in a big painting. There is... Mm, wherever you would see a beige like Portugal for me it's like a cream like a like a very tasteful like tasty yolk cream that they eat like you know that the little pastry that they eat this is like this color palette that I'm thinking about Portugal and it's also so yummy and it's also like a Prosecco for some reason maybe that's because that's why because it was my first travel without my baby and I went I'm breastfeeding so I could have a glass of Prosecco um so all the beige color beige with my work after Portugal it's definitely connected to Portugal. Like it's it's almost inseparable. Yes, when I travel and I see a color, I cannot get it out of my head. Now, when I was flying back from New York and I stepped in Munich and Frankfurt, I had a layover and somehow all the airports in Germany and what I see outside, it's so silvery um, and so blue that this painting behind me 
which is right now black, white, and uh, skin color, like the salmon color, it's going to become like more blue in a second we finish the talk. Like I'm going to take a brush <laughs> and change it. It's like, so, so yeah, <laughs> travels are very, very mm -hmm. um, influencing me. And then, you know, you, you mentioned the the big black brushes and I think that's some something I would say quite signature for you like the, the the black lines are probably on every single piece um, yeah. so could you tell us what what you what is the meaning behind the, is, is that the core of the painting like is that the core motion and is I, that I, I yeah I think this is like so my as we we already established like the fact that my art is kind of a witness of my emotions and uh my day-to-day -day activities and my travels and and it's 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 like this world captured in in a frame of the canvas size uh and definitely the black marks are significant for me i think that they are kind of like captured energy like more than anything else it's like captured energy it's like in a line but it has to, like I've been always using a black color as my signature in a way since I didn't think about it that way when I was a baby or like when I was a kid drawing and making little illustrations I, I I had to have a black color and I had to have a black sharpie or like a black ink and that was just like this bold feeling for me it definitely connects with the calligraphy and how Asia art influenced me too years after when I saw like oh my god like this these lines are hiding so much within themselves this is like the blackness of the blackness of like a never-ending story of a meaning or when you see like a like a black painting on a black painting in a museum you see so much colors in it because the black is never a black it comes from four different colors mixed together so it's like this is like this meaning of endless meanings and solutions of the blackness hmm. so you would say that is like, a, like a, the, the like brain connecting like the nerve in our brain connecting kind of because that's like a multiple solutions to everything like could could we describe it's, it this way it's like, yes um it's when i when i create an abstract line it's it's like an, an emotion that it resonates. It's like a music sound to your ears that it's endless with meaning to what you um, what you feel when when you hear it. Of course, when you hear like a very um, light melody, you immediately have um, like a fun light emotion connected to it. And when you see a bold um dark line I have a butka line or a darker uh, Mozart um kind of vibe of music you you have a different emotion attached to it and I think the most important lines in my art are the black ones they are like words for and the language, like a specific language that it, that it's between English, Polish, and any other language that there is. It's like a Budka language to people to connect on a level of what do you feel? Like mm -hmm. a feel, emo feel language. I, I think I could call it a feel language. Mm -hmm. That um, my titles are definitely gonna help you to understand what I meant, but it's also a possibility for you to feel it. Um, when I, I love the part of exhibitions where people come to me and they see my work and they say, I don't know if you meant this, but I feel this and this, and this is exactly what I meant. And 
doesn't matter what origin the person is from, doesn't matter what language they speak, the art creates like universal language, the feel language that you cannot put in many frames, but when you feel it, you you feel exactly what you should be feeling and that there is no good or bad feelings. They're just feelings. And so far, I've been lucky enough to, to have a conversation with collectors and buyers and people who love my art and they are connecting with the pieces with the same emotions that I was trying to, to put there. A struggle, a love, happiness, um, undecided, like being undecisive or making a decision, um, mm. or if, like so many, so many different. There is like um, a list of um, emotions that people can feel. Like you can, like words that many of us they only um, work and think about like only 10 emotions, like 10 names for emotions, but there is a world of emotions out there. There is like 95 certain emotions that they are certified for, for you as a human to feel and that they are connected to your needs, um, like a need of love, a need of acceptance, a need of um, uh, education, a need of, uh, sleep <laughs> and and when any of the needs is not fulfilled you immediately feel the lack of this emotion or you feel that emotion imbalance. and and this yes this imbalance and and that is kind of like a script I think you can try like a map of understanding Eva art like yeah. a secret island with pirates and a map of emotions yeah. and needs that they are uh, fulfilled or or not yeah 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 you know we i think we we explore quite a lot about about the ideas about all the needs which we all have not not only uh, female um and yes. female lords, but but every single living being i mean i, I would yes. say that even even animals would would probably of course be in the group of all this all these needs which they have and it's it's the, love, the happiness it's the playfulness it's the um it, this is like all very natural elements of of us right all human mm -hmm. all, all, all being yes um, so now, talking about something very re real, natural, your use of paper, the papers which you are using, they are very specific. Uh, they they live with their own life. I would ha I have to say, uh, <laughs> they have they have their. You you define the shape, yet it's not like perfect shape of like square or something. Yes. It will have something additional on top which yes. you as an artist, as a person, you cannot really control. So could you tell us why you chose those papers and what it's so magic about them? I mostly work on um, handmade papers or Japanese uh, papers from Awagami factory. And I do on an exhibition, you're gonna, I believe have one piece, uh, if I remember correctly, cause I did um, a whole edition of the imprints for you uh, on Nepalese paper that it has very own life in it. It has something what is like, I mean, all of the Asian papers, uh, rice papers, they have this um, magical feeling of being one of a kind that each of the paper has a different fiber piece in it. Like you basically, it's almost impossible to take two perfectly looking same pieces of a paper. And this is what I look in my art and this is what I look in choosing paper. Like it's actually a very important part of my uh, art process, like buying paper and, and, and kind of waiting for the paper to speak out to me to be like, I'm this unique piece and you need to take me. Um, I definitely look for imperfections because I feel, I mean, imperfections that they're perfect because they are meant to be there. It's what I 
what I what I love, like kind of this con coincidence of taking a different route to your normal, um, like to your work, like something what can happen on a different uh, pavement, like it, it's kind of like comparison to that. And I, um, I love the edges of the Asian paper because they are feeling even more like a skin to me and the whole see-through part and like how delicate some of the papers are is definitely a connection to how I think about our skin that during the different phases of our life we have a different um, kind of feeling of our skin and this is definitely um, a huge part in, in my prints. So um, I also really love how paper is reacting to my touches and my brush touches and my prints. And as I mentioned earlier, I do create with layers. And the first part of doing Butcalito, but it's like my own way of doing my own uh, way of creating the prints is I do always a monotype at the beginning. So it's a first layer and it's a first background emotion to what I want to print from the Butcalito matrix. And I always, or most of the time, print the Butcalito matrix in black and the monotype is very colorful and free. And the paper always reacts to both of them and it gives additional wrinkles, additional uh, dots and spots and it drinks the ink from one side of the wood a little more than from another. And this is like the whole beauty of my process that it can be unique its own, like each time that I'm putting it through the press, that there's no way in the world that I can make two identical prints because this is not um, a, like digital print. It's not a computerized, it's made by human with a human touch with a human emotion. It's almost like you cannot have two of the same emotions, even when you feel happy. Each time you're happy, it's, it's a different happy. Yeah. And it's, it's, that's also how it's connecting to the Butkalita process, to printmaking process. You have one matrix and you print multiple edition, but each of the happy um, imprint, it's different from another. It's same as with an emotion, it's same. It's so each skin represents a slightly different um, version of the emotion. So even if they have similar titles, they they look different. They are different, and it's kind of like the paper. It's its own artist in a in a way. It's its own object. It's its own piece of art for me. Yeah. It's good to have these insights. So the, my last question today would be. If you if if you have something something else something some additional notes to say to the viewers, uh, but my really good friend told me when I was going for some dark moments, he said to me, "You know, Eva, your talent is that you can take all those dark emotions and turn them into beauty in your art. So this is your fuel, like the the darkness or the 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 lightness." this is the fuel for you to create and you can show people that the really hard times they could turn into beauty one day that this is like a seed you seed and it's gonna grow into endless with possibilities new world so i think that's what i would like to say for my art oh it, Super. It became really cool, but I didn't practice it before. Like I'm just yeah, kind of like, yay, I made it. Well, yeah, but for now, as of 2021, that's what I want to say to awesome. for my art. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you, Eva, for uh, all Thank this you. amazing insights to to you, to, to really you and who you are and how you are. And I just love to see the smile on your face.